from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My great pleasure today to talk to Nicholson Baker, one of America's wittiest and most consistently surprising writers. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Even after publishing 15 books, it's almost impossible to say what Baker's books are usually about. I mean, they're about buying shoelaces, they're about writing poems, they're about saving newspapers, they're about planning to assassinate a president, they're about having sex. Some of them are notable for how big the subjects are. One covers World War II. Some are notable for how small their subjects are. One takes place on an elevator ride. So, I understand you started writing as a technical writer. What made you give up all the excitement of technical writing to write about sex instead? What happened was I was working, uh, I was working south of Boston in a, uh, a company that made modems, which are the machines that help uh, other machines talk to each other. And um, I was about, I was 29. And I'd given myself the deadline that I would write a novel by the time I was 30. And, um, and then I turned 30, and I still had a, I didn't have a novel. And it was really a frightening moment, so I decided that I had to write a novel by the time I was still 30. And that's, and that's so, so I quit the job as a technical writer, which was a, a, probably a mistake at the time, but my wife figured out that we could live for six months if I finished the book, and that's how I finished my first novel. Do you think that technical writing had any effect on the kind of prose you write now? The well, precise observations? Yeah, maybe so. I, I think actually what happened was that the, the piece that I had in The New Yorker, which ended up being chapter seven of The Mezzanine, the first book, um, was what got me the job as the technical writer. <laughs> it was sort of the other way around, bizarrely. <laughs> I, I love to explain how to do things. You know, I think that novels don't, aren't helpful enough sometimes. They don't have enough tips, tricks, you know, little things that kind of help you. That you think, oh, I, now I know how to do something. So I'd figured out a few things, of, of, of how to put on deodorant while fully dressed, that kind of thing. Um, and I thought, you know, give, give something to the reader that is over and above the, the joys of plot and suspense. <laughs> By the, time you were, by the time you were 23, you'd already had a story in The New Yorker and one in The Atlantic, right? Right. How, I, how did the success come so early? Um, I don't know that it was... A, I, it was not a huge... and it, it was a traumatic and exciting experience to get accepted by The New Yorker and The Atlantic simultaneously, but then there was a long, dry period where I realized I, I really had nothing else to say. <laughs> But, um, but that, that, that's what's good about having to, having to work for a living. And, and, I, and I worked in Boston as a, as a temp typist, and I just did whatever people wanted. Me. If people wanted me to roll up posters and put rubber bands around them all day long, that's what I did. If people wanted me to type numbers, that's what I did. And you get to think whatever thoughts that you have while, while that's going on. Those are worn out notes. Don't worry about those. Well, let's get back to sex. Uh, <laughs> another East Coast newspaper that some of you may have heard of uh, once called you the mad scientist of smut. You, you've written... <laughs> well, that's, be I, that's because I have a white beard. And, uh, and <laughs> you've written uh, three novels that would quickly get you banned in most school districts. Uh, one about a uh, phone sex. Uh, that was a steamy novel that Monica Lewinsky apparently gave to Bill Clinton. Yes. Uh, the Formata. Uh, a sequel of sorts about a man who has the ability to stop time and uses it to undress women. And then House of Holes, a book of raunch in 2011 set in a sexual theme park. Are you just following the money or is there something else going on here? What? No, I think I, I actually had a sincere desire to write really dirty scenes. I mean, <laughs> it's part of life, right? I mean, you have, you have uh, times when you want to think about uh, going on an errand and buying a shoelace, and that takes you so far. And then there's, there are times when you want to fill your mind with extremely graphic imagery. Um, and some people do that and don't write it down, and then some other people do it and do write it down. 
Um, so that's what happened to me. What's your religious background? <laughs> well, I come from, I, I was raised, I guess, as in a non-theistic household, but my mother's family are all Quakers. So, yeah. And when I was writing this book, um, I was going to Quaker meeting, not as a, not, not to, not to, you know, find an actual communion with, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always embarrassed to say the word God, but, 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 but th I went to these meetings, they're utterly silent, they're very moving because the windows are open in the summertime and the, and the sound of the traffic kind of travels through the room and everyone's quiet, and then somebody stands up and just says something and and often it's very touching and 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 complicated and imperfect incomplete and then someone else stands up and says and finishes that idea and so um i and i always found that at the end of quaker meeting i i had more to say so this book is sort of a it grew out of the silence the mm -hmm. mandatory it's called expectant waiting the moment when you sit and you can't say anything, and nobody else can say anything. And, and, and at the end of it, you have a lot to say. It's like no, I've been to meetings too, it's like no other time in our lives to have that, you're not, on, you're not tweeting, you're not on the computer, you're not doing anything. No, you, you have to sit. And I was, um, the other thing that I, try, I, I was doing at the same time that I was <laughs> going to Quaker meeting was I discovered cigars. Um, and so I, uh, I, would, I smoked an enormous cigar before Quaker meeting, and then I, and I really, really, and my fictional character is also a, a serious cigar smoker, and so I went into the meeting and I had to kind of, I don't know, flail my arms around to get, and then I sat down and, and, and the woman who was, you know, four feet away from me actually moved away because I smelled so strongly of cigar. <laughs> so it was a kind of a mixed, a mixed of, uh, adventure. You took up smoking at your age? Well, by this time, I mean, I've done what I want to do. If I have a little trouble with, you know, <laughs> throat cancer later on, that's just what happens. <laughs> it's, it's been uh, 12 years since you published Double Fold, right? About uh, libraries and the assault on paper. Yes. You, you ticked exactly. off some librarians then. Well, Double Fold was about the practice in libraries of taking pictures of things and then throwing away the originals. Right. And that seemed to be, a, to be a mistake since the originals in some cases, these big, beautiful, hundred-year-old newspapers were full of color and full of beauty. And I got very upset. Right. Um, and, and, the, and the double fold is a very um, indignant book. Um, it's also very informative. I mean, I had no idea that was going on. It taught me a lot about preservation. Well, it, thank you, Ron. It was, uh, it was the, the double fold, the double fold test was the thing that really knocked me out. It was the idea that a book would have to be microfilmed in a destructive way, guillotined and photographed, and then thrown away if you could fold the corner back and forth, either one or one and a half or two times, depending on the library. Right. And it was really a way of, of Pretending, pretending that this thing was endangered, that it was going to crumble to dust, and books are amazingly um, long, long-lived. If you, all you have to ask of a page is to turn the page, you turn the page. It's a very different thing than folding the corner until it breaks off. So, so there had been a kind of fundraising um, emergency created by a think tank in Washington who said that all books were going to destroy themselves and crumble to dust by the year 2000. Well, that obviously did not happen. And, and, and yet they raised a lot of money in order to give starved libraries enough money to buy a lot of microfilming machines. That was a, that was a sad moment, really, in the history, in history, because we now have less to work with. We have less of the raw material to look at and read because of that policy decision in Washington. And that was a long time, well, several years before e-books were very, very popular. And, and now the enemy in microfilm seems about as threatening as a Victrola. How it, 
how has the ebook shifted <laughs> those, this argument? Those Victrolas are dangerous. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> how has the ebook uh, shifted your argument about the preservation of paper, or has it? Well, I don't. I, I I don't think anybody has an objection to getting words out any in any form. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I certainly read ebooks, and I'm very happy to to hold. I, I like actually reading an ebook in the middle of the night so that my wife isn't awakened by the bedside light, the, the, the iPhone projects the book, that's a great thing. The, the mistake was to take a picture of something or make an image of th something and then say that it was reformatted and that the original thing was dispensable. Yeah. So I don't think the argument has changed. The major research libraries have a very important job, which is that they hold on to the things that we publish. And if we publish them as ebooks, they hold on to them. If we publish them that, as things that come off of printing presses, we hold on to them. Right. And they and they hold on to them so that we don't have to. If you feel that you're sick of a certain book, you don't want it on your shelf anymore, you shouldn't feel, my God, this might be the last copy in any library. You just want to give it to the to the. Uh, you know, you want to you want to be able to throw it out if you want to, right? right? Right. It helps us be able to get rid of things if we know that there are cultural institutions who can't get rid of things. Right. Shift, shifting gears here a bit, you once said that uh, most of the time, what I want from a book is for it to be funny. You are a very funny writer, but we I don't think we have that many funny books in this country. Uh, think think of all the serious prizes; they very rarely go to comic books. Why That's is that? true. Why, why, is why, that? Is it, why is it? Why is it that American culture doesn't? You know, what are what what did we what do we really contribute? What did what is what are our what is the most and best kind of art that we have done as a nation? Is it the novel? I'm I don't know. I think our greatest novelist was a guy from Russia who moved here, you know, and started to write brilliant things here. TV comedy. And singing songs are probably the, the the best, our greatest contribution to the world. But people don't take humor as seriously. Um, Why is that? I don't know because it's so frighteningly true. I think. I think it's harder to do, don't don't you? There are a lot of great sad novels, but there are very few great funny novels. You know what I think seriously that it's easier to be sad. Uh, you can I, you can immediately imagine a situation in which somebody is being bullied or persecuted or in some way having a terrible experience. Right. But to do something that is actually a surprising bit of truth that you think, ah, oh, my God, that is you know. And so so somebody like Dave Barry is actually performing this incredible service of telling the truth in a funny way, mm -hmm. in a way that serious novelists like me cannot. You write very funny novels, too. <laughs> uh, your new novel, let's talk about that. You've got it in your hand here, Traveling Sprinkler. It's a funny novel. It's about Paul Chowder, who we met a couple of years ago in The Anthologist. Now, in that book, poor Paul was trying to write an introduction to a collection of poetry, right? This time around, he's trying to write songs. And Is the there some autobiographical element there? Yes, I think all my books, even the ones that are physically impossible, like the Fermata, where you can't really stop the universe, stop time, but all of them are ideas that went through my own head. Um, in the case of the anthologist, uh, I invented this guy who had to write an introduction to a, an anthology of poetry because I had to write an introduction to a book that my wife and I were working on, of pictures of old newspapers. We, I had taken the photographs and I got very excited about it. I bought a big wooden camera, 4x5 uh, bellows camera, and took a lot of photographs, and she wrote the captions. And we had this art book that we were doing together. Yes. And all I had to do was write the introduction. How did it and go? It was just, it was very slow. And I, I went up to the barn and sat there and tried to start. Writing an introduction is harder than writing a, a novel, I think. <laughs> and so the book is really about the fact that I would come down from the barn. I mean, the truth behind the fictional thing is that I'd come down from the barn and she'd say, how's it going? And I would say, it's, 
it's not going, you know, and it was the horrible idea that you're disappointing your own wife is, was, was the energy behind The Anthologist. And then I found finishing that book that, um, that I had learned the way this man thinks to the point where I wanted to write a second book. I wanted also to have a happy ending. I wanted, I wanted the love, I wanted to write a book, about a love story that actually in which two people end up together. That, that seemed like an exciting thing. And you have a musical background too? I was a bassoonist. Yeah, I don't know if that qualifies. Bassoonist. You a gave it all up for writing. <laughs> the bassoon is a, a long, a, a tall wooden machine that uh, kind of appealed to me. It has a Victorian complexity to it. It has many levers. And you put it together. And, and then these sounds come out that are kind of human. Um, and I played it uh, way too, my, too many hours in high school. And then I was a, an applied bassoon major for, for a year at the Eastman School of Music. And I wanted to be a composer. I wanted to be a classical composer. Um, and then I f sort of, I sold my bassoon and lived for a year. It was $11,000 I got for the bassoon. Wow. Yeah, it was a very good investment because my grandparents bought it for me for $7,000. So, wow. so, so I was able to live for a year on the proceeds of my bassoon. So I was still playing the bassoon. I was just playing it as a writer. Paul's songs are not very good. Do you think? Um, uh, all right, Ron. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote, um, so. Are Paul's songs very good? So uh, there, there are 12 songs that you can listen to if you buy the so-called enhanced Oh, I haven't heard that. E-book. All, all I have is the book. There's an e-book. There's an e-book uh, in which, and if you buy the e-book, you can listen to these songs at the end and you can decide for yourself. Okay. But I, I don't know if they're good or not, but I had <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> I, I, I mean, th if, if life had been like this when I was a music student, I would never have left music. Because you can, you can uh, I'm not a terribly good pianist, but you can layer piano, <laughs> piano lines together so that you sound like, I mean, you could do things that Debussy could not do. <laughs> because you can have a reach, you can have 12 piano notes going at once. I really worked on the songs. That I was writing the book, the novel, at the same time as I was writing the songs. And, um, and every time I had, kind of felt I had a breakthrough, I thought, oh, that's a Stevie Wonder riff that I'm really happy with. I put that in the book. I thought, chapter nine, I've, I'm here. I've got this. I've got this little fragment that I'm happy with. So there are a couple songs that I'm kind of proud of that's good. that, that, that uh, ended up. One's called uh, Love is an Amazing Magnet. Magnet. Yes. And it's true. <laughs> you got to tell the truth. Explain the title to us. Traveling Sprinkler. Well, you don't need one right now. <laughs> but um, is a machine. It's a cast iron, beautiful little tractor-like machine that you, and you hook the, the hose up to the back end of it, and the water goes up through the middle and twirls the uh, helicopter ends around, and that's very nice, but what it actually does is it also has a gear, so it pushes the, tra the rear tractor wheels forward, and that's very nice too, but then there's a, the, the miraculous thing about the traveling sprinkler is that it follows the root of the hose. So the source of its power is also its future. So I, my dad got me a, tra a traveling sprinkler when I was seven years old because I was in Sears with him, and I said, this is a, a machine that I understand. I love this machine. This is the great American machine. And, um, and I've always wanted to put it in a book. Um, and and the, the great thing about it is you can go anywhere, anywhere around your garden in this machine. So the, the, the reason it's, it's called the traveling sprinkler is because this is a book about a man trying to figure out the, the proper route, how to be a better person, yes. how to fit, reconcile political indignation and love and idleness and, and make, make his way to the end and, and actually sprinkle. 
The idea is to sprinkle and, and to water the tomatoes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What, what, that is the goal, is to contribute in some way, make something grow, make something better. The book is full of uh, riffs on all kinds of subjects, some pretty serious, politics, for instance. Are those very close to your own ideas? Are you concerned about the constant surveillance of our lives? I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about, the, about pictures being taken. What I'm concerned about is innocent people being killed in foreign countries by unmanned machines. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was written during the election period, and it's, it's written by a man who is, you know, somewhat disappointed in the president because he increased the, the level of drone attacks hugely. Um, so I wanted to put that in. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to, to try to look at the problem of how we have, you know, he, this man, Paul Chowder, is very lucky. Nothing terrible is happening. He has plenty to eat. Right. He can, he can, uh, he has enough uh, to read. He's got a nice house. His barn collapses, but that's a sort of transitory thing. But he, um, he reads terrible pieces of news that come in. And how do, you know, that, that problem of, of figuring out how to digest a terrible piece of news at the same time that you then have to, you know, make an egg salad sandwich. That, that balancing the, the various things is what's hard. How do, you, how, how do you be, how do you keep, or how do you learn how to be a moral person yeah. um, in the midst of bad news and in the midst of trying to also just have fun and do the things that you feel you do pretty well? Right, right. You and I, was, was a memoir of sorts, right? It was a, a, a memoir slash piece of literary criticism. Do you think we'll get another memoir from you? Or do you like investing your, your life and your thoughts into these characters more? You and I was a book in which I decided that I would write about John Updike while he was still alive, and I would write the entire book without ever preparing, without ever looking, reading what Updike had written to prepare for the book. So all I had was the working memory of what I had read, the, the, and sometimes the things that I'd misremembered that he had said. So, um, uh, I did my best to, I guess it was a study in memory criticism or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and this book began as a memoir. I wanted to write a book about trying to write protest songs at the same time oh. that I was, it was, it was really a, it was really a, a first-person memoir book, and then I found that I was writing more and more in the voice of Paul Chowder, and that it gave me a little distance. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Um, but yes, of course, I, I love diaries, I love letters, I love uh, things in which people are doing their best to explain themselves. So I would, you know, love to give it, a, give it another try as a, as a memoirist. We'll look forward to that. You take some questions from the audience? I'd be delighted to, and thank you for your questions. There's a mic here and a mic there. Uh, hang on to, I'll turn it on in a moment. You could yell. The, it's on. Um, so first, I'm glad you brought up you and I, because my first comment is just that when I read you and I, uh, I felt like the it really spoke to me because of its commentary on the way that readers often feel personal connection to a writer that the writer obviously cannot share because it's a one-way street. And I was like, I feel this way about Nicholson Baker. Ah! So that was really cool. Um, I Thank felt you. like if only I could tell him that I would write a you and I about him, he'd get it. Anyway, um, you just said that you almost think that TV comedy is better than America's contribution to the world of literature. And so I want to ask you if that figured in in any way to your decision to appear on the Colbert Report, or if it was just an attempt to sell more copies of your book. <laughs> and explain what, what, what that experience was like, because that okay. was wild. Well, that, it's very raw, because it was only, what, two, two days ago. Yeah. But, um, well, for one thing, Colbert, I, I didn't... I, didn't realize how blindingly brilliant he is, how quick he is, how fast, and how you, and you never know what's going to happen. And the strange thing was I was seated, and then he did that whole thing where he bows and takes the credit for the guest. And I have really very little memory after that of, of what happened. 
It was so traumatic. And so, <laughs> and so it was strangely, it was, it was, I, I didn't know if I was delighted or that I was in a living hell. I had no, I had no idea. But I just said whatever. And, and the, the other thing was that he asked me exceedingly personal questions <laughs> that I should have answered truthfully. But I, I said to him at one point, Stephen, you're getting very intimate. Because I felt, you know, is there a line that you should not cross on national TV? I don't know. My mother said that, that she didn't know that the P word could be used that often, you know, in a, in a TV show. And I, I, I felt that, it, that maybe that was true. Maybe, maybe there's, there's a case to be made for restraint. You know, that's you, what's great about books is, you know, they're, they are mute and they, they don't live in your mind till you're in the mood. And, but when you're watching a TV show, somebody's going to bombard you with a P word all the time. Would you do it again? Yes, I would. <laughs> well, for one thing, in the green room, there were all these wonderful shampoos and body washes and it was, it was incredible breath fresheners they had. And, and you get a $100 uh, card to give to a charity of Stephen Colbert's choice. <laughs> he was, no, I thought, it was, I thought he was very smart and um, very, very gracious and out of character, he is, he is himself. And in character, he is a, a right-wing talk show host. But the interesting thing is that's starting to crack. So there's, there's Colbert mixing in with, with the right-wing host, and you don't know whose rules you're playing by. So I would love to be back. I don't think I will be asked back, but I will. You will. It was hilarious. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, I was wondering, when you're writing about a character who is very different from you yourself, is very alien, is there a process, a, a sort of standard process you go through to get into the mind of this character to understand and grow? I, I noticed that you said in the second book here, you started to write again about the character and the anthologist, like you really felt you hit the momentum in this kind of character development does this, how does this typically happen with you to, to build a new human being from a corner of your imagination that isn't, that's very unlike you, say? Well, that's a, uh, it's a real problem. How much do you allow, how much, how close do I want to be to the people that I call characters? And I think that I always just feel that um, I should try to tell the truth for as long as possible. And then there comes a moment where it, the truth is so awkward that I have to start making adjustments. Um, in the case of Paul Chowder, he is unattached. I'm married, I have two children, and I sort of, the reason I think I ended up writing the book was, what would my own life be like if I had never found my wife? You know, and I, th I realized that I would, I would be very like this guy. I would be kind of forlorn, and I would feel that I had made a terrible mistake, and I would be looking for something. I would be searching for something that I hadn't found. So part of it is just what I know that I would react a certain way. And I, so I posit that and then come up with it. Um, in some cases, I've never had a tent like this before. Well, I wish I could talk that fast. I, um, or that loud. I, um, in the case of the, 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 the very sex, sexy books, you know, that what I did was I took a piece of my own self and put it in a Petri dish, and then I put a very strange nutrient solution around it, and it just grew into this huge fungal mass of sexuality. <laughs> and I said, whoa, yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And that, that was a book. I mean, I think that in, in a way that's what, what all writers are doing, is taking pieces of themselves and then, and then artificially giving that piece a lot of miracle grow and saying go and, and following it. But, but you, you, in, in a way you have to p pick part of yourself and not... If you pick your whole self, you're going to over... You, you, there's too much. So you have to select but then artificially stimulate. Hi. 
I'm going to return to that subject of sex again. Uh, first of all, thank you for the books that you've written. I love them. I think they're wonderful. And do you get tired of defending yourself? I feel like whenever I read an interview about Vox or the Fermata that you have to defend that you've written this stuff. I think you do a marvelous job, and the reason I think that it's great is because you treat it the same way that you treat the minutia from you know, the mezzanine. It's thoughtfully written about sex, which is why I hope you write some more. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a kind of lovely question. That is a, I felt when I wrote the Fermata, I was unhappy because there were a few bad reviews. In fact, there were a few horribly bad reviews. I remember one from a British writer, Victoria Glendinning, who's a writer I like, she, she ended her review, goodbye Nicholson Baker, goodbye forever, which is, you know, <laughs> conclusive. But um, I also, re I, I mean, I talk to people and they say, well, that, no, no, that one was, was one where you really got to it. And, and I realized that people have very different reactions to things. And I've gotten somewhat thicker skinned over the years, I guess, um, and found out that people's initial reaction to a book sometimes changes. I think sometimes if you startle people, there's, a, there's a, an initial kind of irritation at the startlement, but then later on, there's a, a more forgiving um, attitude. Also, it's just, it's just true that not everybody is gonna like every book. I certainly don't finish all the books I like, and I also make mistakes, and I, I reject a book sometimes, and then later on, like it. And I also, I have to say that I've made mistakes. I've written books that I wish I hadn't written. Um, it just, it's just part of the process of strugglingly trying to do the best you can do. And, and you never know how it's gonna turn out. But it's more fun than not writing, so. What are you working on now? Um, well, I'm in that kind of, uh, uh, that undertow moment, you know, when you finished a book and you don't know how it's going to be received. <laughs> and I have uh, several different things that are partially completed. One's about Korea, yeah. uh, other things, and a, a memoirish kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I never know what, what, is the, what's, what are the force fields that are going to be in place after I, I finish and see the reaction to this book. So I have a bunch of other things that are sort of waiting in the wings, and I don't know which one to, to push out and finish. Finishing is very hard. I would think that's the case with your books, because they are very contemplative, they're very thoughtful, they're not plot-driven. How do you know when it's done? It's done. It's done when um, you've reached about, well, it used to be done when you've reached 135 pages. <laughs> No, I, I used to really like the idea of writing extremely short, dense books, and now it's, I, I think it's, you know, now it's 287 pages. It feels done when it, it feels like a, you've reached, in this case, I, it felt done because uh, Paul's girlfriend had a hysterectomy. And um, it's a, this is a love story about a hysterectomy, you know, and, and you reach the end of that. So it was just, it was, I actually had a plot with this one. You wrote a wonderful review years ago about a book I wrote about my daughter, um, and it was called The Everlasting Story That's of Nori, and you book. actually liked it. I did very much. <laughs> Thank you. And it was so thrilling because it had come out just uh, after a book of essays, but before the book of essays was the Fermata, which was very dark and sneaky. And you actually liked this, liked Nori, because it was, it, it was about a genuinely kind, good-hearted girl. And so um, I just felt that I'd reached the end when I had told the truth about her life in fictional form. I don't know. It's just a, it's very hard to say what, why, why it feels like an end. But um, I seem to write, a, it seems to take me about two months of sustained effort and I get to the end and I'm exhausted and I'm so craving that last sentence. I want to be done so badly. Um, and that's, that's usually when I stop. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello? What 
that. Um, what roles have books played in your life? Uh, what, what books had an impact on you as you were growing up? And uh, uh, what sorts of authors uh, have an impact on you now, uh, including um, comic novelists or, or uh, uh, comic writers? Including what, sir? Comic writers. Oh, what comic writers? Well, so okay, the comic you, writers. You could repeat the whole question. Yeah, so the, so the question was about what, what, what writers were important to me when I was growing up and what writers, comic writers now are. Robert Benchley was a huge figure in my life. I discovered him after college, but he was, I just thought he was, he was brilliant and charming. I didn't know anything about his personal life. I didn't know that he had a bathrobe in a whorehouse, anything. But he was a brilliant, brilliant, funny, charming pers persona. And so he was one of the comic writers who really helped me understand that you could be, you could be true and funny at the same time. When I was growing up, I was really interested in science fiction. So I wanted to be a science fiction writer. When somebody, when I was in fourth grade, a friend of my father's brought a stack of something like 25 dog-eared science fiction books and put them on the ironing board. And I just, I remember this exciting idea that there was this enormous stack of stuff about outer space and hardware and alien beings, and I read my way through that. And, and that was, I think that was what taught me how to read, was reading science fiction, which is maybe why I ended up being so opposed to anything that wasn't mundane, you know, so opposed to the supernatural, because I maybe had had um, out, worn it out, I don't know. But um, after the science fiction phase, the big discovery for me, I have to just be truthful, was Nabokov. And I, I read his memoir, Speak Memory. I read a paragraph in there that was about telephone wires being seen from uh, a train that was so beautifully described, I was about 15 at the time, and I realized that, that there was no other way to get at that truth. No film could have done it. It was only words describing it that could describe the way the telephone wires were smacked down and when it would go up. And I remember thinking, I've seen that from the back seat of the car. I've seen those same telephone wires do the same thing. And that was Russia, and this is now, but it's still the same moment. And uh, that was what made me want to be a writer and ma made me want to give up trying to be a composer, which was a good thing because I wasn't much of a composer. Yes, sir. Uh, what are some of your favorite newspapers? And are, is the answer the same to, as what newspapers do you regularly read? And consider who's sitting here. Yes, without pressure from your dais mate here. Yes, the Washington Post book world is my go-to place. Uh, <laughs> No, I, um, but I mean, I, I, I think we have to be immensely grateful to, to, to modern newspapers, and I read the, the Times and the Post and all the places that you should read. Um, the problem with reading the daily newspaper when it's published is just the, the fatigue of the names that we all, that we, we're so familiar with the stories. Well, so what I kind of like and what I liked about collecting the old newspapers was that I didn't know any of the names. I did I mean, Coolidge, you know, or who was the Under Secretary of State in 1953? We don't know that. We, so I like the idea of going back in time and, and reading older newspapers because they were an amazing time machine. That You were nailed to a certain date and uh, the New York World, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, is, is probably the greatest single publication in the history of the United States. You know, it's an astonishing thing. He completely revolution. Pulitzer's paper was all of cable, all of blogging, all of everything in one gigantic thing that happened every day and came out millions of copies out of a basement in New York City every day. An incredible triumph. The idea that one copy of that thing exists in its physical reality is is shocking, and it's why we need to why we real why the we have to understand how fragile the past is and how important it is for for us to have institutions that save us. 
So I'd have to say that my favorite newspaper was probably Joseph Pulitzer's World. Very diplomatic answer. Uh, <laughs> it's been such a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. It was a great pleasure. Thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.